Well, good morning, and welcome to the Stories for the Cooped Up and Captive. I reckon I'm what you would call a cradle Catholic. Baptism, First Communion, CCD on Sundays. But in the 32 years since I've been confirmed, I've kind of devolved more into the cafeteria variety with subtle influences of Buddhism and a healthy respect for my friends who are agnostics. By my way of thinking, if you're kind, you're good. But my best friend, Eric Roberts, growing up was a Baptist, so sometimes I'd go to his church too. And I fondly recall Pastor Bob. Bob's sermons were always relevant and engaging. His weddings were warm and personal. A neighbor passed away, and of course, Bob said a beautiful eulogy. And of course, afterwards, there was church lady food in the basement while a blizzard raged outside. I remember Bob going outside, starting the cars, cleaning the windshields, shoveling a path, and escorting three elderly ladies to their cars. Afterwards, I shook hands and told him how welcome and warm his congregation felt. Well, little did I know just how welcome and warm his congregation was because years later we found out that he has, was having intimate relations with one of his parishioners, had embezzled $45,000 from the church bank account while his wife was wrestling with breast cancer. And then there's Frank. Frank was known around here as a town drunk. For a while, he owned a bar in one of the bergs outside of town. One night, the cash register jammed. He didn't have a crowbar, so he pulled out a 38 and unloaded six rounds into the keyboard with a bar full of patrons. He also loved to hunt and fish. Problem is, you'd look out and seeing him hunting pheasants in your bean field or poaching your deer stand or standing on your boat dock catching bluegill without asking permission. Now, Frank always had the most beautiful ye yellow Labrador hunting dogs, but I always prayed he would never call our clinic for services. Well, I got my wish. He never called. He would just show up without so much of a please or could you and expected us to jump. Well, one time he did call ahead, and that time required me to recalibrate. You see, his daughter worked for a dairy farm in Minnesota in a pickup truck that I wouldn't drive from here to Quick Trip to get a cup of coffee. He drove through the night to the middle of Minnesota and searched until he found that dog running around with a broken leg. He called me an hour and a half out. Doc, I'm coming in. I got a bad one. See what you can do for him. We put him on the x-ray table. I'm looking at the films and from over my shoulder, I hear, you know, Doc, he's got all kinds of shrapnel. It's a total non-union, but I swear he's trying to form a callus. Well, as it turns out, Frank, the town drunk, is also pathologically kind to animals and served three tours of duty in the jungle as a combat medic, saved a hundred soldiers and a senator's son. Lance Armstrong, Exhibit C. For those too young and unacquainted, Lance Armstrong won the ultimate endurance event in all of sports seven straight times after he was diagnosed with metastatic testicular cancer. From his first stage win in 1999, he was accused of doping. Finally, in 2012, the USADA concluded that he was the kingpin of the most sophisticated, professionalized, performance-enhancing drug racket in organized sports history. He was stripped of his two world championships, Olympic gold medals, and seven tour victories, and $5 million. In his documentary, Lance fell on the sword. What he regretted more than losing his titles, more than the deceit, was the careers that he had destroyed and the teammates and competitors he had crushed. Well, now hear this, Lance Armstrong. This is what I see. The news media love to portray it as if the only reason why he won those Tour de France victories was because of the drugs. Well, I got news for you. Nestor Gomez could do EPO testosterone and blood dope and he wouldn't win a single stage of the Tour de France. He had to out-train, out-work, out-smart, and be tougher than 177 of the most elite bike racers in the world seven straight times. And not one of them ever endured three rounds of chemotherapy weighed 75 pounds and did not have the strength to get out of a pool of their own vomit. 
Before it was dismantled, the Lance Armstrong Foundation donated very nearly a billion dollars to cancer patient advocacy. When he was racing all over the world, there were oncology wards full of children with cancer cheering him on. They had hope. He launched road cycling in the United States and put hundreds of thousands of people on bicycles, and I was one of them. And he wrote this book. It's not about the bike, my journey back to life. I read that book huddled in an oversized chair, overstuffed chair in front of my fireplace, half drunk, while I had no idea where my wife was, who she was with, and if and when she was coming home. When I put that book down, I got on the bike. At the time, eight miles to the grocery store for a gallon of milk was a marathon, but for a year, I trained. Next thing you know, I was holding my own in pelotons and local races and wreaking havoc on Wednesday group rides, and I conquered a mountain just outside of Durango, Colorado. With that strength, I walked away from a relationship in which I was belittled and disrespected with my head held high. So you can call it disguises. You can, my wife calls it layers. It is not our place to judge, but by my way of thinking, good people do bad things. Bad people do good things. They say you never get a second chance to make a first impression, to which I say bullshit. If all else fails, keep something moving forward. Over and out.